Hello, everybody. Hopefully you can hear and see me. Uh, my name is Tomo Nakahar. I'm head of uh, developer experience at Weaveworks. So thanks for joining us. Um, if this is your first time, welcome. This is part of a series that we've been doing uh, as part of GitOps Days, uh, our online event, uh, and also for some of you, maybe long time uh, parts of our uh, members of our community. Um, sometimes it's the Weave user group as well. Um, so we'll explain a little bit of that. So either way, if it's your first time, welcome. If you're back, uh, it's great to see some uh, familiar names in the list. So for this particular series, what we've been doing is um, every two weeks in this fall, uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, Lee Capilli here, who's a developer experience engineer at Weaveworks, um, covering sort of the key points of GitOps and doing live demos um, as uh, some of you, maybe Flux users, can see that uh, we've been creating the new version of Flux and um, rebuilding it to have more capabilities and really provide um, what we strongly believe is the most powerful um, elements of GitOps that you can leverage uh, now and moving forward. So we've been really excited to um, see Flux um, develop and advance um, every week. And so it's been great to also have Lee here share those updates and um, how they would impact you. Um, and so hopefully you're interested because you're coming here, you're looking for um, information about GitOps, um, or if you're a Flux user, um, you're I'm here to find out what the latest updates are. And so we're really excited, excited to share those with you. So um, as I mentioned here, so really these um, events, we've been calling them GitOps Days Community Edition, um, and uh, as well as for the Flux community. Um, so this is really geared for you primarily, especially if you are a Flux user, um, you are aware that um, we have Flux One in maintenance mode. And so we wanna make sure that people know about that and know about what's to come. Um, we haven't started the migration process yet, but if you want to get involved and check out the guides and such that we have, um, we would love to have all your feedback to make sure we create the best migration path possible um, when that time comes. Um, and if you're new, um, welcome. Uh, hopefully these will cover some of the basic concepts of GitOps as well as have you see um, you know, real uh, on hands way how we've been um, building what we feel is the most powerful way of accessing GitOps, both as a concept and as a practice. So today uh, we've been doing this sort of as a series. So if you haven't seen the previous events, no problem. Um, we're kind of covering different areas that you might be thinking about and live demoing them uh, for <clears throat> excuse me, for um, getting started with GitOps. So today uh, we'll be covering dependency management and ordering. And uh, as Lee was sharing earlier, the workflows, workflows, workflows. <laughs> so we'll be kind of covering uh, various areas and we'd love to have your questions. Every time people have been very active with questions and comments in the chat. So it's been really exciting. <laughs> um, so great, um, a little bit about us. If you haven't heard of Weaveworks, uh, we've got Lee here, as I mentioned, our developer experience engineer on Tomo in developer experience. Um, and the behind the logo is um, Stacy, uh, one of our community managers has worked really hard, especially for this series, um, to let you know about what's going on with currently, I'd say our key open source project, um, which is Flux. Um, it is already in the CNCF. Um, it's a sandbox project, and we're actually um, completing the steps right now to get into incubation. And it's kind of the project that really started this concept of GitOps, um, which our CEO then coined, um, not necessarily to put the concept out there, but as an observation of what he already saw kind of happening in the space. Um, and I think as Lee has articulated really well in our past talks, it's um, really kind of part of the evolution of Kubernetes itself. So um, hopefully you've come to our GitOps Days events um, and you'll see the recordings, um, but uh, you know, you don't really need to be only using Kubernetes. And in fact, you don't even have to be only using Git for GitOps. Um, but that concept itself, I think, you know, it's a practice and um, an approach that we've been really um, helping to uh, lead and, and educate around. Um, so aside from that, um, Flux being our key open source project right now, um, you probably know about Flagger, which we're actually um, putting into the Flux repo. Um, and Cortex, Ignite, EKS Cuddle, um, WeaveNet, there's many, many more. Um, if you look at um, both our CNCF um, GitHub repo around Flux, as well as those under WeaveWorks, you'll see all of the many projects that we've done were very much founded on open source. 
Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, so these are usually about 45 minutes long. If they're really short, we can end at 30, but these tend to, with questions and stuff, to go to about 45. And if there are a lot of questions, I think pretty much every time we've gone over with a hard, hard stop at 60 minutes. So um, these are all recorded uh, and you can um, come check them out later. You'll get an email. Uh, if you signed up with a correct email address, you'll get an email from Stacy following up with um, both the links to the recordings. And a lot of times when we don't get to all the questions in the chat, we'll uh, follow up with answers to your questions from our illustrious team. Um, and then during uh, these COVID times, I don't think I have to explain too much about basics of using Zoom. That's the platform that we're using. Uh, I think just the main uh, thing to remind everyone is to make sure you select um, to all panelists and attendees when you ask questions or have comments in the chat. Uh, and then that way everyone can see, especially if you're providing information to other people, which is really nice. Um, so with that, just a basic overview of GitOps, if you're new to it, um, you will follow up as well um, with, like I said, like the links to um, our recordings from GitOps Days, um, which has a lot of that great information. Uh, if you actually haven't registered for that, you can go to gitopsdays.com and you'll get us um, early access to the videos from our latest event. Um, but these are really the key um, areas, right? It's, it's not a particular tool. GitOps is not a particular tool, even though we're highlighting Flux. You know, GitOps itself is a methodology that we really promote, regardless of what tools you use or what tool combinations you use. Um, and it's really, yeah, it's a methodology. It's a it's a paradigm. It's an approach. Um, and as I was mentioning, you can apply it to everything, um, and it brings a lot of business value. Um, if you see a lot of the talks that we have, it's really fun to see the various kinds of ways that people are applying GitOps to all parts of their um, operations and um, app dev um, areas as well. So it's not just one or the other, or you know, it's not uh, right relegated only to those spaces. Uh, and uh, if you saw in our talks as well, um, our CTO Cornelia Davis uh, nicely sort of outlined the four principles, which are still just a starting point. Um, so if you came to our first GitOps Days event, sort of outlined these four areas where you know you have a system that's declarative, you use you're using versioning, not necessarily in Git, but you might have a versioning system. For example, um, Google Sheets is versioned, so there's a concept of sheet ops, um, and approved changes can be automatically applied to the system. Um, and then you also have um, reconciliation and um, software, agents, software agents that ensure that correctness. So that was sort of the starting point. And um, if you've checked out um, the GitOps Days event that we just did for EMEA, um, like I said, if you sign up, you'll get those recordings early. Um, Cornelia then advances those concepts into patterns. And so, you know, the more that you, you know, you'd start at any place, everybody starts with baby steps. Um, but the more that you start bringing these two together, or three together or four together, then you start really getting these GitOps patterns that um, will help you get the most powerful um, uh, experience of GitOps. So hopefully with that, our demos will also uh, illustrate some of these concepts that um, were laid out. So with that, time for demo and I'll uh, hand it off to Lee. Hey everyone, yeah, I'm so stoked to be joining all of you today. Uh, any chance to sync up with real Flux users is a total treat, uh, whether you have been with the project since V1 and helped pioneer uh, what GitOps really is and how that's practitioned in the community, how it's practiced, I guess. Uh, so all your practitioners, huge heart for you. I come from a background of like Puppet and, you know, kind of the archaeology of GitOps, you know, back before we had Kubernetes and these really fast reconciling controllers. If you're joining us for Flux V2, uh, I'm also excited to be showing you today some of the shiniest and most powerful detailed features that allow you to build workflows that are specifically tailored to your platforms, your teams, your environments and applications needs. Uh, and so we're going to jump in today. Um, a forewarning that this demo is like super fresh. And I mean that in both how cool it is, like it's it's dope, it's fresh, but like also let's see if it works. So uh, we're gonna work through some things, um, but what I am excited about is that the repo is published. I already believe that there's a huge amount of value in the repository. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And uh, you can find this repo on my GitHub. 
Uh, it is Stealthy Box Flux app demo. Feel free to clone and fork that. It's already good to look at as an example of how you should structure your Flux environments with multiple clusters, uh, with dependencies, and with uh, applications that are sourced from customized libraries. So here we have a library folder. Uh, these are other repositories, just ignore those two. Uh, but here's the lib folder, and this has a bunch of customized bases in it. Uh, we're going to be using the traffic ingress controller, uh, as well as pod info. Uh, and then there is like some policies in here, as well as a debug pod for our developers. Uh, we have a kind setup. There's two clusters that we're going to be working with here today. If you joined us for our multi-cluster demo uh, last time, or the cluster API demo I did for GitOps days, uh, you'll recognize this repo structure a little bit sort of similar. And then there's a config repo, which has a folder for each one of our clusters. So what I was working on was making sure that we could get a healthy uh, bootstrap of our uh, repos together uh, for each one of our clusters. So you can see here in the um, play directory, ah, I see, see, I made a mistake. This is totally fine though. This is gonna be the flux directory. That's what that should be. And I should remove that directory completely. Infra, there we go. We're gonna get this working. just deleting that flux system directory from the wrong one that I was trying to apply. And we will go ahead and commit that up to our control repo. Just says remove wrong flux system directory. So the reason why that was wrong uh, is because I want to stage a couple of different customizations into my environment. Uh, so I want my flux system stuff what actually manages the Flux installation via our repository, I want to bootstrap that into the Flux directory of a particular cluster. So we have two clusters in the config there. There's play and production. And then I'm going to have several stages of my deployment. So here we're going to first synchronize everything in the Flux directory using the bootstrap command. And then from there, there will be additional customizations that deploy out of this flux system extras that will apply the other three folders for the play cluster. We'll do a second bootstrap once that's working for the production cluster, which is right here. So here you can see it's the same structure. Um, and yeah, in the flux directory, we are expecting to deploy flux system. There's just nothing in there right now because it's not bootstrapped yet. Cool. So let's go ahead and just check that everything's pushed. Cool. I'm going to make some brand new kind clusters here. So I'll just using the repo scripts, uh, we are going to clean and set up. That actually shouldn't be a problem, but we'll just make sure to start off fresh here. And then, um, these extra customizations that we're expecting to apply are, like I said, coming from the Flux Systems Extras directory. So the first thing that I want to talk about is going to be Flux's dependency management system that you can use with customizations and recently uh, Helm releases as well. So you can make Helm releases depend on. And um, so there is, say, for the infra sync. Right. When we normally have a Flux installation, we have this GOTK sync YAML that goes in the Flux system folder. This Each one of these folders inside of these sections applies to a namespace in our cluster. So in the Flux system namespace, we're going to have a Git repository resource and a customization resource. Now, if you're just joining us and haven't heard about Flux 2, we have two separate custom resources now. Uh, driven by different controllers, the source controller and the customized controller. 
A uh, customized controller can apply plain manifests and customized directories. And the source controller is responsible for syncing the repository to our cluster. So the really powerful thing about this is before in Flux 1, you would really struggle with determining what is the reconciliation problem that I'm having. Now you know if there's an apply failure, you have detailed logs on what's causing that failure. So just moments ago as I was forming the demo, I was missing a namespace. I had a log on my customization object that was telling me, hey, this namespace is missing, so I can't apply the objects that you wanted to apply. Similarly, say that my repository authentication was not set up. I would get a specific error message related to my authentication mode on the Git repository object in the status conditions inside of Kubernetes. So you could look using kubectl or k9s or whatever your Kubernetes client is, the dashboard, the web browser, uh, or using Octin, you could find that error message directly on the resource you're trying to apply. Now, you'll notice that we no longer have this coupled to a Flux deployment. There's a custom resource that expresses what Git repo we want to sync to the cluster. But you can have multiple of these. So we're going to use that feature today. All right. We have this customization. I mentioned that we're going to have more customizations that we're going to apply to the cluster and that there's a dependency management system. Oh, this is good news. We're having a healthy apply and everything synced to the cluster. So let's just talk about what we're trying to sync before we start looking inside the cluster to see if everything's working. We have this InfraSync YAML. So in the InfraSync YAML, what I've done is I copied the customization from the GOTK sync. Right? And it's sourcing to the same Git repository that the Flux system is being managed from. But instead of syncing the path from config play, our play cluster, Flux, right here, we are going to sync the other path, which is config play infra, right? And so that will sync this folder to the cluster using customization. So, or sorry, I shouldn't say sync, I say it's applying this folder, right? Because it's a customization object. That's how we apply a path inside of a Git repository. So here, this is the Flux system Git repository uh, from the main or the master, yeah, main branch. We're gonna apply that folder. So everything inside of the infra folder is gonna get applied. That means that this dev folder uh, with this namespace is gonna be applied. So we're gonna provision our dev namespace. We're also going to provision our stage namespace. And then in addition to that, you can see that, uh, oh, that's, those are missing namespaces. Let me add that one down. I already made this mistake so many times. Mm, so we'll commit that, and then it will get reconciled to the cluster pretty soon. We'll do that in the infra for both of this one's missing it. Create our production namespace. Net policy. There we go. Should be good. Git add status. Net M. Add dev stage and prod namespaces to proper clusters. You'll notice um, that I put the dev and the stage namespaces into the play cluster. So that's why it's the play, it's the play, playground sandbox. And then we have the production cluster with the production namespace. So our infra folder is going to bootstrap that. Um, and then where were we? So everything in the infra folder is going to get deployed because we had the infra sync YAML from our flux system extras folder applying that folder. Now the infra sync YAML uh, has a health check. So we'll have to see if that passes. Let's check inside the cluster. And this health check is important. You'll see why. Uh, so right here, what I'm going to do is the CRDs have been applied to uh, check out or uh, install the Flux system. And that means that I can view all the custom resources in the cluster for Flux. So if I say were to do kubectl, it's just K on the machine, 
And then I get the Git repositories. And I can't type. You get CRD. Okay. What cluster am I hooked up to? This is weird. Why is that name spaced? Um, sorry. Could have sworn that we bootstrapped this cluster. Did I not bootstrap it, I guess? Oh, maybe I didn't do that. Okay, sync flux from our repo to kind cluster zero. That's right, I made brand new clusters. Sweet. And then we'll go ahead and also, since we have a second cluster up, we will bootstrap using our repository. That's just my username. My personal repo instead of an organization repo. Using this repo, Flux App Demo, which is the one that I pushed up at uh, this path, which is config production flux to the kind cluster one on the main branch. I could change this to be like a tag if I wanted or something like that, but we're going to use the main branch. Name is required. I have something wrong in my bash for some reason. What name is required? Oh, I see. There's like spaces. That's a syntax issue. There we go. I should trust Michelle more. That was definitely a syntax problem. Cool. Um, here, validating data, unknown fields depends on, I'm gonna have to fix these really quick. This is in the customization resource under spec, there should be a depends on field. And I must have just put that in the wrong space on the customization. Let's go look at that really quick. Play cluster and in our flux management, this is where we manage everything flux related. We would just make sure, yeah, I have it indented at the wrong level. So anything that does depends on, we'll just indent that one. And Sorry, friends, making some typos today. Hopefully you're learning along with me. Uh, if you ever want to learn about what you did wrong in your Flux deployment, you could look directly at our documentation. Uh, or if you've never learned about kubectl explain, uh, you could also look at there. And that's usually much better. But here you can see it's the same documentation, more or less. So, so I looked here for the Git repository spec. And then if I wanted to look specifically for what I was looking for, that would be the customization spec, uh, which would show the depends on field is right here. So yeah. Sweet. Let's pull this up. And then flux for the production sync as well just needs to be invented one. Cool. Fix customization depends on syntax. Right. So that should synchronize rather quickly. I won't worry about doing it for the production cluster. Uh, but in the interest of time, I just kind of check to do. Oh, wow, that's an old command. Flux reconcile. I don't have webhooks set up because I'm using my own personal uh, like kind clusters, so I don't have any kind of ingress. 
but I guess I could do something like that with inlets or some tunneling, or I could even use a GitHub action, you know, to call flux reconcile from like a wire garden network or something. Um, but since I don't have that, I'm just invoking the flux reconcile command, which will notify the custom resource, uh, the Git repository called flux system inside of the flux system namespace by default. Uh, so I just want to make sure that that revision is fetched. It's probably already fetched because it's doing it every minute right now for our demo. Um, but yeah, should be should be looking pretty good now. Let's look at the Git repositories. There we go. Now our tab completion is working because I actually bootstrapped the cluster. So um, here we've got error. We couldn't find the remote ref for dev and for stage, but for the flux system, it is synchronized. So hopefully you've realized I've done something kind of interesting here. Um, I have the dev and the stage customizations synced up to a different place uh, than the flux system repo. The flux system repo is just tracking master. And if we look at our customizations instead, then we can see that the flux system has applied the revision and the infra customization that we we're talking about has a reconciliation in progress. Now we don't have any dev or stage tags or a production tag in our repository yet. So those sources haven't synced for dev and stage because those are different refs than the ones that we're interested in synchronizing for the flux system and for infra. So that will be part of our workflow demo, but let's just see if we can get the health checks and the depends on stuff working first. Okay. Um, I'll just go ahead and add those tags now since I'm pretty pleased. Uh, we will get tag dev stage and we won't tag production for now. And we'll push those up. Pretty soon uh, Flux's reconcile loops will pick those up as we're moving through the demo. Uh, I just did a, I just tagged the main branch uh, here, the most recent one we have, uh, to that where we fix those customizations with the depends on things and everything's applying properly now uh, to the remote branch. So that's, those tags are all pushed. Cool. So um, the thing that we would want to look at is let it, let's look at describing the customization inside of the flux system namespace for infrastructure because this one has a health check that I was interested in uh, making sure was was working correctly uh, so it says reconciliation in progress uh, the fun thing about this is that in the libraries directory uh, for the traffic folder I have a customized uh, customized base but if you look in the customized base, uh, the resources that it's referencing are these two YAML files, Helm repo and Helm release. And for Helm repo and Helm release, uh, we have these flux API objects for Helm release and Helm repository. So this Helm repository is gonna sync traffic's Helm repo, the one that they maintain, inside of uh, their own organization to the cluster every 10 minutes, just to make sure that we have all of the most recent versions of that chart on a regular basis, so six times an hour. And then similarly, we're gonna just make sure that our ingress controller is deployed on a regular basis, uh, that it's conformant. And so this is going to use the Helm client libraries uh, inside of Helm controller, which is another component of Flux. Helm controller is going to make sure that we have a declarative way to manage this release. You can see that I have values specified here uh, to be serving node ports and uh, a redirect to the HTTPS port for traffic. So that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and use the Helm client tool. Since I have permission to read in the cluster, uh, I want to do a Helm list of all namespaces. And we, we see that there's no um, release yet. So that's probably because my uh, probably because my health check or my Helm release definition is like wrong, or maybe the repo is down, or I type something wrong. So I'm going to just look at Helm releases, see if there's an issue. 
It says this reconciliation is in progress for this Helm release. I'm just curious now if there's actually been any um, Helm repositories synced to the cluster. And uh, that revision was fetched properly. So our Helm repo is hooked up together. Remember how I was talking about the separation between a Git repository and a customization, how you could now see if a source was synced properly versus a source was applied properly. It's that same exact pattern that we wanted for Helm controller. So in Helm controller, we have the Helm repository, which just makes sure to synchronize the source into the cluster source controller. Now we know that we have that revision. You know, we see that it's up to date and that it's properly synced. So we know that we have charts that we are available to install from our repo. And then we can use the Helm release to try and do an actual instance of that chart as a release in the cluster. Now, the reconcile is in progress here, and I don't know why that hasn't been reconciled yet, because four minutes seems like an awful long time. So let's go and debug that. Hopefully, you're getting some value out of seeing how observable the new APIs inside of Flux are. And, um, I guess I'll move to the big terminal for this. So I'm just going to describe inside of the Flux system um, for Oh, maybe it's in traffic. Helm release. Yeah, this is where we are. So apparently the Helm install is failing and um, that's not really that helpful. Timed out waiting for condition. Kind of early. Um, to, so I never successfully installed this chart before. That's just going to be my apologies on that. Um, in order to skip the demo, I'm going to use, skip that part of the demo. I'm just going to remove the help check on that resource so that it always succeeds. Um, or rather, we could find something in the cluster uh, that is already deployed. Oh, there's a deployment right here. Oh, it's called Traffic Helm. name inside of the traffic deployment it's traffic helm that's already successful and then if we look at the customization that means that the health check has failed um, so that that does make sense because i have it hooked up to the wrong place so for the infra one this is reconciliation in progress we're going to move to the infra sync and then change our health check uh, it's inside the traffic namespace but this is called traffic helm because i guess I named it that. It's probably my fault. Yeah, I called it Traffic Helm. So of course, that's what the name is. That's just my, my issue. So here we see the diff. I'm just going to update the infra sync to have a different health check. You'll notice here, um, I just want to point out that one of the huge values of using GitOps uh, is that in Kubernetes, if you're just applying and mutating the cluster, there's no history. There's no version control, there's no comments, and there's no diffs. So when you always are moving to synchronize or changing the state of the cluster through the Git repository, then you'll see in the log that I deployed this incorrectly. And you'll get that context if you're trying to figure out what happened. Say you were in an outage or you wanted to see how something was brought up. So, um, here we will correct the health check for the infra sync. And I will uh, everything push that up. Kick off a reconcile. So we were trying to fix a customization, but all I need to do is just make sure that the Git source is reconciled. That's because the controllers that interact uh, with the custom resources for sources and customizations, as well as things like Helm controller, um, they talk to each other using Kubernetes events. So you get very reactive and reliable behavior, uh, even though you're not manually reconciling the specific thing. If the Git repo that some customization depends on gets updated, then uh, as soon as that Git repo changes into a successful state again, uh, then the customization will apply. So if we look at the customizations, 
hopefully now infra let's just describe the spec for that really quick system infra. Um, uh, customization just want to check that the uh, health check is properly configured here to show that uh, the git repo so this is how many is traffic configured. You can see here that these are all the individual objects that were applied by that customization. Oh, it says reconciliation succeeded. Uh, so that's good. Do I just need to look at it again? Okay, yeah, it's looking fine now. Sweet. And then that dependency succeeded. So here the stage and the dev, um, uh, syncs that we have have now also applied since that was satisfied. So before, when the infra customization was still reconciling because our health check was not passing, then that dependency for the development and stage applications was not satisfied. Right, and you can see that if you look here in the dev sync YAML, there's a depends on, the infra needs to be ready. And that's important because inside of our infra folder right here, say for development, we provision the namespace. This is also where you would do things like limit ranges. You could put more R back into this customization you can also see that I'm sourcing a library from my repository, from the same control repo that we're using to apply everything. I am applying some network policy. And if you were to say, look at that network policy because you're curious about what kind of policies I'm enforcing on development, I have imposed the workflow on my dev team. I'm gonna allow all ingress. So anything can access that application but I'm denying any egress. So anything that our development services needs to access, uh, say we've hypothetically made a team decision uh, that we are in a very secure environment uh, and we don't want our code just randomly reaching out to any network endpoint. Right? Say we are using an interpreted language and we're worried about remote code execution, right? or we're using a legacy stack. We can enforce a layer a, a, a defense in depth. So we have a layer of security here that's protecting us now. If we need to reach out to a particular billing endpoint, if we need to talk to a particular API for managing our user's database, if we're using a service that does that for us, then we would add exceptions here inside of the control repo for our, our development infrastructure, we would allow that. And so this is no longer an administrator logging into some machines and changing firewall rules. And since we're using GitOps, even if you're using Kubernetes, you might have been in an environment where this kind of stuff was manually changed and did not have good oversight. And even if you're a developer and you know that you need an API endpoint, you would not be able to make a pull request. But if you're using GitOps, then suddenly that process is so much more transparent, but you don't lose the granularity of who is actually in charge of managing that change. So super cool, uh, hopefully learning some, some neat tricks on the kinds of things that you can do when you structure a repository like that. Uh, as I stated earlier, this stuff is up on the repo. So go take a look. Now uh, you saw that we were able to um, basically depend on the infrastructure layer using Flux's depends on feature, right? So here in the customization, dev and stage, they would depend on those namespaces being pre-provisioned and they depend on the network policy to be in place, as well as for the ingress controller to pass its health check and become ready before any of these manifests would be applied to the cluster. That frees up the ops team to know that as soon as I deploy a cluster, there's never going to be an opportunity. There's never a time period where things that are in the developer's control are going to have insecure access to the cluster. It's always going to be constrained, constrained by the policies and the infrastructure and the platform that I lay forth. That means that if you need service mesh injection, you can put it in here and you can be sure that any app deployed to the cluster is going to go through those admission mutating webhooks. So uh, check that out. 
Uh, I said a lot of big words there. Sorry if you're Kubernetes noob. Um, please know that none of us know everything. Uh, so uh, come on this journey with us and ask each other questions. If you don't know what a uh, mutating admission webhook is, uh, go look into it. It just relates to service mesh stuff. Uh, cool. So we talked a little bit about that. Now for the last bit, um, the treat is that Flux is not just useful for deploying infrastructure. You can see that I'm deploying a dev in a stage namespace and controlling policy. But if you actually look in the folders uh, that are deployed there, uh, then you can see that there is um, inside of the dev namespace, I have lib debug being deployed. Inside of the production or inside of the stage namespace, I also have lib debug being deployed with pod info. So both of them are deploying these two applications. One is a debug shell intended for our developers. And then the second is say their hypothetical application. Right? So we use pod, pod info for our demos a lot because it's nice and simple. Um, if you look in the production namespace, uh, I have as the say DevOps or platform person working with that team, uh, the production namespace is inside of our production cluster config. And so in apps production, production, that's the namespace, we have a customization here that is applying only pod info, not the debug stuff. You'll notice here that there's no uh, namespace in this folder, and that's because that's deployed for us by the infrastructure, right? So that's where the namespace comes from. So the developers can have full control over this. Uh, you can do that with uh, repo ACLs or put this into a separate Git repository and sync the customization differently. Um, none of the, none of Flux is like prescribing any particular repo structure or folder for you. Uh, so that gives you a lot of freedom and um, hopefully you're able to then use our examples and these demos and these recordings to decide what fits best for your organization. Um, it's not, you know, my belief that I can decide for uh, any number of users, whether they should be working out of the same repositories, the same folder structure, uh, or whether they should be using tagging or branching uh, or committing, you know, atomically or that kind of thing. So uh, similarly, I would not ever enforce, you know, that everyone use PGP signature verification uh, on all of their on all of their commits, but that is a feature set that Flux provides. And so we want to allow you to build what makes sense for your teams and your platform. In the same way that Kubernetes is a platform building platform, Flux is a GitOps building platform, right? So, all right, it's a platform for building GitOps rather into your organization, your teams and your culture and your practices. So we have some tagging going on. I just wanted to uh, check in on my production cluster really quick because I think I'm pretty sure we bootstrapped that. Let's just check in real quick context, we're going to look at kind cluster one was our prod cluster. And let's just see what we got in here. We have a core DNS deployment. Oh, this is not bootstrapped. Really? Did I not do that? Pod cluster, cluster one. Fascinating. Okay. Well, flux bootstrap. This is going to be the flux app demo repo using config production flux to kind cluster one. Make sure to run that on the main branch. And um, let's go ahead and take a look at what we have deployed. So let's go and deploy something to dev. We can see uh, in our wide and dev. We don't have any pods here yet. There's no pod. Oh, pod info. We have one in stage, but not in dev. Why is that? Look at the described flux system customizations dev. This made some deployments. Did I just not override the namespace or something? It's definitely possible. 
there is a dev namespace and a stage namespace, but then the deploy. Is... Where in the world? No, There's a part there, of the... there are comments yeah. in the chat. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. People, people trying to help. Pod folder namespace is dev. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That, that is silly. Um, so production, here's the apps production stage of our sync. There's the production folder. Somebody helpfully pointed out that if I were to pay attention, um, production, that one's production, but then the customization. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Maybe it was one of the other folders. Oh, I should look in the infra folder. Is that what was being pointed out maybe? Infra production customize. Yeah, thank you. Good catch there. So silly. Um, it's worth noting that once you start getting to repositories that are this complex, uh, you will start making mistakes like that when you're trying to assemble this much YAML quickly, like I am. Uh, hopefully, you would have enough peer review and process to catch something like that before it gets really committed. Uh, but making the incorrect namespace inside of your um, cluster is not that big of a deal. I do have prune enabled on all these customizations. So when I change this resource, uh, the dev namespace will get deleted and then the production one will be created. Um, that's you know on, on you whether or not you want to have prune enabled in your cluster. I personally don't find it to be that risky uh, to have your GitOps controllers deleting resources that should no longer be declared in your repository. Um, but you can change that behavior in your customization if you would like. Uh, thanks for pointing that out. That's one mistake there. Uh, I'm suspicious of my own bugs now. Let's just check the dev namespace and the stage namespace are created. Cool. Um, diff, cool, get commit, and uh, fix prod namespace. Thanks, Andreas. There's that. And here we are at 11.48. Cool. So we're pushing up on time here. Uh, let's talk a little bit about workflow. Uh, because you saw here in the Flux folder, and I have the same kind of layout in the production. So in production, there's Flux system sync extras, there's production sync. And this Git repository copy called production is pointing to the same repo, um, but it's syncing on the tag production, right? So this one, we have no tag in the repository that exists for that yet. So that means that production is not deploying tag L, there it is. We only have dev and stage. But we saw when we actually, so like if we were to look at the Git repositories inside of context kind cluster one, context kind cluster one, all these spaces. Git repositories, no, I guess that's not synced yet. That's a peculiar, interesting. That might be a bug. Anyway. Um, but yeah. So if we look at cluster zero, dev and stage are deployed. And um, they have this, the same setup here. So ref tag stage uh, on this repo is then being deployed to a stage specific folder. So there's a combination of indirection here. We're pointing to one repo, but for stage, we're also deploying from a stage specific directory. And we're only syncing to the stage tag for that stage directory. What this lets you do is I can go into the library, say for my application. And I could either use a patch for this, or I could just go and edit it directly. 
I can update the tag. So here, my diff is that I'm updating the pod info deployment to 502. Now, this is a library that's used by all of my environments. So it seems like that would maybe deploy all at once, right? Because there's no environment specific patches, you know, inside of the dev folder, it's just using that pod info library directly. Right, so Lee, isn't that kind of dangerous? You know, if you're like trying to deploy your tag to all of your environments at once, uh, seems kind of painful. Like that looks really easy to manage because now I have one place where I can update my version. You could actually just update this version and release off of this diff using a GitHub action uh, or using make generate, you know, if you wanted to make file that read this value or populated it. Uh, so really small change, but where's the granularity, right? Um, commit a m update to v502. And this could happen in CI. We'll see how much more time we have to comment on workflow. But if I push that tag up, then now my git log looks like this. So I've updated the main branch and what did I do with dev? Yeah, dev is actually syncing on a tag. I'm glad I did that because production, I forgot to bootstrap that cluster. Um, so dev is here and stage is here still. So the manifest on those tags is not updated yet, even though I've made a commit to the repo. This means that development can go faster than however much we want to deploy. If I would like to automatically deploy that, I could use a GitHub action or somebody could you know, update the tag. And that would be really great, right? Because then I could just say git tag dev. Um, do I have to like force this? Yeah. All right. So then I, you can look at our thing again. And it's your decision on whether or not you allow mutable tags. Otherwise, you can use a tagging policy or semver or whatever. Um, but yeah, so here we got tag dev. And then we will push the tags. Uh, dev, dev already exists. Do I have to force it as well? Yeah. There we are. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Andreas, I like your I like your comment. I'm glad that you're getting some value out of this uh, because this is this is what I wanted to get into with workflows, right? So once you've gotten past like dependency management, you get all of your policies into a cluster that makes the infra team happy. But what about your release team? What about your pro your project managers? What about your devs? They want a good experience in controlling what versions are released into the cluster, right? Um, so it's like, okay, well, I just pushed that. Um, and now, and I've used this workflow before, but just without flux years ago, because uh, I do used to do a lot of release engineering. So I've updated the tag here. I can look and get, if I'm a developer and I want to know what version is released, I can look at my log. I, I can make sure to pull all my tags from the upstream ref make sure like, okay, where am I, right? So here I can see, like, I could look at my CI status using other command line tools and things like that, whether using Hub or Travis CI or Circle CI or whatever. Uh, and then in Git as well, you can see where I expect the development environment to be versus stage. Similarly, if I wanted to do a rollback, I could move this tag back, right? And use the same, um, the same CI artifacts, right? The same Docker images that are produced. I could rely on the same uh, tests. Like it's, it's just an instantaneous decision. So this separation of concerns between continuous integration, like continuous builds that you're getting from your CI infrastructure, and then the clean divide between where GitOps kind of starts, right? Which is your configuration repository being versioned and you instructing the controllers what versions of things to synchronize to your clusters and to which namespaces and from which folders and to where, right? what cluster, what namespace, which folder, what ref. This gives you indirection. You can, you can combine this and get power, right? But we're not prescribing you to a particular workflow because if you don't want to use tags, you could use a production branch. Or if you want everything to track main, you can still have the separate folders and then update each folder with specific patches one at a time. And if you need to break glass and change your workflow immediately to respond to some outage, then you could still use a patch in a specific folder. You can migrate workflows. 
you can do rollbacks in whatever way you see is fit, right? And then, uh, I mean, it would probably take a little bit of time to go and observe, you know, that those uh, tags have been updated in the cluster, but we could at least uh, look to see if the customization has been applied at all, right? Before we wrap this up. Um, oh, I want to get customizations. Here we are. So here we can see uh, that stage is at that older ref. Uh, our flux system and our infra are up to date and that the dev is on the newest commit, right? This allows you to have power over uh, what versions of your application you're deploying. Uh, a little bit on workflow as well. I mentioned that say you don't want people to have to tag every time they want to release in development, right? Then you could have a GitHub action that after it pushes your image, successfully to the registry with that tag uh, or whatever version you're specifying in the um, in your application manifest you could then commit that version back to the uh, config repo or use a policy on tags or whatever um, as well as when our image update reflector uh, is finished you know then you'll have even more options with flux uh, but you could auto tag the repo right here you know just from a ci job uh, on merge to main uh, but then you have your granularity for explicit release policies. So whether or not, however this st stage tag happens, it's probably different from your development process, right? Because you're going to want to maybe do QA in this environment or do integration tests or performance testing. Uh, so maybe there's some cron job that you're running in the background, you know, to access that application uh, and validate it for whatever staging reasons you have. Uh, similarly, maybe it's enough to get rid of stage now that you're continuously deploying dev and then you can just do roles to production and rely on other safety mechanisms such as flaggers, canaries, or other projects that we work with. Right? So um, yeah, I had an MS Paint window. The last thing that I just wanted to talk about uh, is maybe not best illustrated there, um, but it's just about the Helm release um, indirection. And I, I wanted to make note of this because you can already push to a Helm repository uh, and then have the Helm repository update based off of, where is it? Version. Oh, maybe, maybe it is the Helm release, sorry. You can already uh, have a Helm release do a version policy. Uh, and this can be a Sember string. Uh, so you're able to push to a Helm repository and then have a particular policy for how you want to release from it. But then how do you get the indirections between different environments when you push a Helm chart? And my recommendation there would be to do the same thing that I did with the Git repositories. Uh, and you could make different instances of Helm repositories or different Helm releases that have a uh, that contain a different chart, right? So if you have a production Helm repository infrastructure and then your stage and your dev, then you would be able to push through those registries separately and then get that indirection. Uh, the limitation that what I'm pointing out there is that you cannot like in a Docker registry, you can tag the same artifact multiple times but you cannot do that with a Helm chart uh, in, in a single Helm registry, to my knowledge. Uh, so if you had multiple of those, then you would be able to indirect. And the cost of that is just pushing a Helm chart, uh, which could be you know maybe a couple kilobytes. Um, so it's kind of big just to do a release, but it should happen pretty fast with our modern network infrastructure. So that's one way that you could accomplish that uh, if you need a tagging policy with like filters and stuff using what's already in flux today um, for like automated builds and helm charts. Um, so the same kind of combination of indirection there. You can use directories and customizations and patches and tags. You can also use these tagging policies uh, to build what you need. So lots of comments on workflow there. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining me. And um, yeah, I, I feel like I don't want to neglect all your questions. No, uh, well, definitely. I'll, I'll, yeah, we'll follow yeah. up in email. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and I think, yeah, like often depending on the speaker, right? Sometimes we'll address questions during the talk, sometimes at the end. But in this case, I stayed a little bit silent because I knew that 
Lee was juggling a lot of different things. And like I said, we always follow up with email um, with a variety of answers. So we will definitely do that. And thanks to many of you. It's great to see a lot of you answering each other's questions and giving advice. So that's definitely what this is all about. Um, so with that, I will um, take over and just share our closing slides, which, oops. For some reason, I have lost them. Um, so I'll just let you know, Stacy. Maybe you can jump in. Uh, remind everybody when is our next um, and potentially final talk of the year, given that we have the holidays coming up. I think it's in a couple December weeks. December fourteenth, we have that December fourteenth. Okay, yeah. great. So thanks. Yeah, um, uh, as we've mentioned, uh, we have our. Um, meetup page. If you look up um, GitOps community, that's our um, one of our main meetup pages. If you're already on our Weave user group meetup pages, we have those as well. Um, so that's the best place to um, be informed of the next one. And of course, if you've signed up by email and you haven't opted out, then you'll get an email notifying you of the next one that's coming up with Lee. Um, and yeah, a lot of good stuff here and I really appreciate it. So thanks so much, Lee, for going through that. <laughs> it's always, uh, I mean, you're very prepared, but always uh, never know what's gonna happen with demos. So it's good. I, I always wanna be more prepared. You know, if I can be because we have such a great community as, you know, is here with people answering questions and helping out with the demo. Yes. Um, so these resources are public and we can iterate and improve on them. And I'm excited for the next version of this demo where we can talk more about maybe some uh, GitHub Actions workflows or something like that with Definitely. tagging policies. So, All right. You know. uh, so thanks everybody for joining and we hopefully we'll see you next time. Thanks, Lee. And thanks, Stacey. See ya. Bye-bye. <laughs>